Hey everyone, Diavolo here, and today we're back at it with the pinnacle of all domain videos. And this, we're going to cover all of the known domains that have been introduced to us or mentioned throughout the series so far. A domain expansion is the most incomparable technique of any Jujutsu user. It is the peak of the essence, all pulled forth and imagined through an innate domain that itself is covered with a barrier to construct it in a different space. With Jujutsu sorcery, hand signs, words, dance, and other forms of expressions all expand the level to which someone can manipulate curse energy. A domain expansion is expanded through the use of one of these actions. For example, Mahito opens his mouth wide to perform his, while Dagon forms a symbol on their torso. First of the domain expansions that we see throughout the series, Coffin of the Iron Mountain is the special grey disaster curse's Jogoat Supreme Art. This fiery domain meticulously replicates the inner sanctum of a roaring, live volcano. Encased within an impenetrable stone chamber, its colossal walls and floors are riddled with gaping crevices that gush forth copious amounts of molten magma. This results in a temperature so hot that any typical Jujutsu user would instantly succumb to spontaneous combustion upon setting foot within the domain. Fittingly dubbed the Coffin of the Iron Mountain, this is a lethal type domain that is equipped with a guaranteed hit. To activate the lethal sure hit technique, the user can control with ease all of the lava and molten rock flowing around the inside of the domain and direct it towards the target. Seen right after we witnessed the Iron Mountain, Unlimited Void is one of, if not the most advanced technique in the vast arsenal of Limitless. Due to obviously being the stronger and more refined of the two domains, Gojo's Unlimited Void easily overpowered and suppressed the effects of Jogo's. When it comes to the effects of Unlimited Void, this domain inserts the user and their targets inside Limitless itself, a boundless void filled with infinite flowing knowledge. Within this vast space, a constant flow of complex information floods into the minds of the targets, overwhelming them to the extent that they become completely paralyzed. The incapacitation of the target occurs due to a unique phenomenon where the target is both aware of everything and yet unable to perceive or sense anything at the same time. It's as if every action they've ever taken in their life is being repeatedly imposed upon them, causing them to suffer a slow and inevitable demise. It's worth noting that this effect doesn't actually impact the user or anyone they are in physical contact with. So if you were to be stuck in this domain, the only way to survive it would be getting a hold of Gojo or repairing that destroyed brain of yours with reverse curse technique. Third up, in nearing the final seconds of Mahito's battle against Hanami and Yuji, he was able to discover something by using his death as an inspiration. Opening his mouth, Mahito throws up miniature gang sign hand seals formed by tiny hands inside of his mouth to activate his domain expansion, the self-embodiment of perfection. This infamous domain creates a vast, dark space where Mahito's target encounters enormous hands that come together to form a flower-like shape. These giant hands are connected by multiple arms, creating a net-like cage that encircles Mahito's intended victim. The self-embodiment of perfection works by amplifying the effectiveness of Mahito's curse technique, idle transfiguration, and ensuring it directly affects the target's soul instantly. Being inside the self-embodiment of perfection is described as feeling as if you're figuratively in the palm of Mahito himself. Due to like how idle transfiguration works, this domain expansion is an almost sure kill type of domain. The only way like one would actually survive is if they had some form of ability that allowed them to block damage to their soul directly. One thing I do want to point out about domain expansions, if given time a domain user can easily decide who is caught by their domain, as we saw with Mahito's first bout against Yuji and Nanami. However though, when the preparation time is extremely limited or the conditions change, one can't specifically choose who is caught by it. This here can lead to a few drawbacks of Mahito's domain, and if he does accidentally touch the wrong soul, it can backfire with drastic consequences. Next up, and using its fingers to craft hand signs, the smallpox deity can activate their domain, graveyard, and instantly trap an opponent inside. As the name suggests, the domain itself is just a graveyard. What's special about it though is how it plays on the curse's innate gravestone technique. Due to a domain usually being granted with an automatic hit, graveyard enhances the curse technique and automatically traps the opponent with the highest curse energy output in a coffin. Then, once the conditions are fulfilled, it guarantees that that person will be infected with smallpox and die. These conditions are that the curse has to count down from 3, and if it reaches 1, then it wins. If someone escapes the coffin though, it can continuously use this short hit technique over and over again to trap them. On top of that, the gravestone itself deals critical damage when putting someone underground. 
Next up, and I somehow initially forgot that we saw Megami's first use of his domain during like the last few moments of season one. Although not fully able to be constructed into a sphere, Chimera's shadow garden, when expelled in an environment that allows it, saturates the surroundings with dense shadowy liquid. This allows any user of the 10 shadows technique to summon multiple Shikigami at once and have free manipulation over all of the shadows in the area. Additionally, it also brings forth a sizable structure resembling two columns of spinal bone interconnected by some form of nerve endings. However, this object vanishes shortly after the initial activation of the domain. Anyone standing in the shadow will have to reinforce their feet with cursed energy or risk falling into the abyss below them. This includes the actual user themselves. If one was to fall into the liquid like shadows, there is no buoyancy, resistance or oxygen. Anyone who has dropped into them will fall indefinitely. And you know, I wonder where Megami currently is right now. Next up, Dagon's domain expansion, Horizon of the Captivating Skander is activated like I said earlier in the video with a seal on his stomach. This results in the creation of a serene, tropical beach type domain. This domain is often described as peaceful, and the water near the beach is shallow enough for someone to stand in. This domain did actually make an appearance during Season 1, however it was only for a moment while Dagon was still in his cursed womb state. Within the horizon of the captivating Skander, Dagon's innate technique ensures that the Shikigami crafted by him automatically strike their designated targets. From the perspective of those being targeted, these fish-like Shikigami seemingly materialize out of nowhere, making them exceptionally hard to predict. This is like because the Shikigami actually only come into existence at the very moment they make contact with the target. One of the techniques inside of Dagon's domain that takes advantage of this sure hit effect, Death Swarm, takes the form of multiple large marine-like Shikigami and has them constantly attack until the opponent is devoured. The only way to stop this endless sea of death is to disrupt the cursed spirit's domain and glitch out the sure hit function of it. True to its name, and next up on the list of course, the malevolent shrine, not the freaking kitchen, creates an area focused around a small, singular altered Buddhist shrine that has been distorted to instead enshrine demons. The shrine somewhat resembles a Chinjudo, and if you remember back to where exactly Megami was looking for Sukuna's finger during the early episodes of the season, well, I think it, you know, it kind of makes a little bit more sense now. Anyways, anyways, instead of the, like, the, uh, obviously picturesque, peaceful shrines that these deities have, Sukuna's shrine, or the freaking kitchen as some nut at Crunchyroll decided to mess it up and call it, is encircled by murky, dark colored water, and the ground is adorned with horned skulls. The roof is embellished with protruding horns and suspended human skulls. The four entrances to the shrine take the form of large, grotesque mouths featuring human-like teeth and tongues. Unlike almost every other domain seen in the series so far, Sukuna's domain is built different. Instead of just like imagining an innate environment and surrounding it with a barrier to give it structure, the King of Curses, Ryumin Sukuna, is equipped with a barrierless domain. An art so far beyond normal comprehension, it's as if someone is painting in thin air without the use of even a canvas. The Malevolent Shrine's guaranteed hit ability enables it to ruthlessly slash through anything within its effective range until only dust remains. To do this, Zakuna employs two types of slashing attacks, namely his known and extremely trusty cleave and dismantle. These two slicing attacks will not stop slashing until the domain is disengaged or Sukuna is too severely injured to sustain it any longer. Sukuna obviously, you know, also has the capacity to choose between these two attacks based on the target type, opting for dismantle against inanimate objects and cleave for subjects with curse energy. I'm just assuming off the top of my head right here that Dismantle would actually be able to work on people like Toji and Maki, people who are considered buildings by Curse Energy. This is also how Sukuna was able to cut the world if anyone was confused. He used Dismantle to cut the inanimate world behind Infinity itself. So you kind of like get that a little bit more now if you couldn't understand it. He didn't actually hit Gojo directly, he cut the globe behind Gojo and man was just in the way. Also on top of that we've seen Sukuna implement a few different conditions into the structure of how his domain is formed. For example, during his battle against Gojo, Sukuna's domain grew beyond Unlimited Void's barrier. With the domain's barrier being weak to like attacks on its outer shell, Gojo's domain was crushed by malevolent shrine slashing attacks and he was immediately struck by its can't miss attack. Throughout that long battle, some of the binding vows he placed upon his domain were like removing Malevolent Shrine's guaranteed hit effect within Unlimited Void's effective area, or narrowing down its effective range, similar to when he used it in Shibuya to like dodge Megami and stuff. 
In exchange, Sukuna was granted increased power to counter Gojo's own domain improvisations. I didn't like mention those improvisations during Gojo's infinite void or unlimited void part of the video as they technically qualify as binding vowels and I'll stick that in a binding vowel video if you guys want to see that in the future. Seeing as we're here now though, simply Gojo could do a bunch of like similar improvisations. He could expand his domain shell or reduce the overall size of the domain to a basketball, which was something most sorcerers deemed absolutely impossible because how are you supposed to imagine yourself being that small or something, you know? Either way, moving forth. Seventh of the known domains that we've seen throughout the series so far comes from the first opponent our main cast faces during the culling game. Hiromi Higuruma's deadly sentencing creates a large courtroom where the user and their target stand across from one another playing the roles of prosecutor and defendant. Unlike most of the domains we've seen throughout this series, and just due to Higuruma learning the use of his technique in private, deadly sentencing is a type of domain that isn't considered lethal. It can still be lethal in the end, but it doesn't actually contain a can't miss attack like others. Way back in the early days of Jujutsu Discovery, Probably before even Sukuna, a domain expansion wasn't used as a finishing move, instead they forced those who were caught inside to abide by the rules or bindings of that domain's technique. Once caught inside of, you know, like Higuruma's deadly sentencing, the law type curse technique imbued into the domain allows the user to prosecute their target with a shikigami called Judgment. Inside this domain, no physical violence is permitted for either party. Initially as it starts out, Judgment reveals the accusations against the accursed, which consist of real crimes they may or may have not committed. Despite Judgment having access to all of the information about everyone within the domain, this knowledge is not given to the user. In the trial, the final decision depends on what each side says. After hearing the accusations, the person being accused gets one shot to defend themselves. They can choose to stay quiet, admit guilt, or say they didn't even do it. If they deny, they can, you know, obviously even lie, just like you can in real law. The goal for the accused person is to convince judgment that they're innocent and clear any doubts that it might have of them. Once it's the prosecutor's turn in deadly sentencing, they get a single chance to speak. Their statement is like a counter-argument using evidence given by judgment for review. The evidence comes in a sealed envelope held by the prosecutor. The information inside isn't treated as definite proof and it stays closed until after the prosecutor speaks, keeping the accused in the dark. However, Judgment shares the info with the prosecutor as soon as they get the envelope. After both the prosecutor and the defense have had their say, Judgment steps in to give a legal verdict. If the accused is deemed guilty, they face one of several possible sentences, though the user of this technique isn't certain which one it'll be. The severity of the punishment can vary, with the more severous crimes leading to harsher penalties in certain cases, and the worst obviously being death. Before the verdict is given, judgment often dishes out a punishment called confiscation, which stops the guilty person from using curse techniques. Once the verdict is given, the domain expansion disappears and the punishment takes effect on the guilty party straight away. However, if the accused is found guilty without openly admitting it, they can ask for another trial and judgment has to agree. This is called an appeal and even though it has been like specifically stated in the series, I'm assuming someone has the right to at least two appeals just like we do in real life. When it comes to this next expansion, Idle Death Gamble, we are probably going to be here for a little while. This technique is so hard for my small brain to wrap itself around, it really is one of the most mind boggling techniques seen so far from Jujutsu Kaisen. It's not crazy blowing up city levels of like mind boggling or like technical wise using stuff from like outer space, but Hikari had to just go and be a creative genius with way too much time on his hands. Firstly, the full name for his domain expansion is Idle Death Gamble CR Private Pure Love Train version 1 out of 239. The CR stands for card reader and it's actually based on a real pachinko machine with obviously the same name. Dude is like a total degenerative manga reader or a gambler, probably both in actuality. The user of this domain's goal is to hit jackpot by lining up three of the same symbols decorated with the characters of Pure Private Love Train. There are seven different characters in the Pure Private Love Train series. Starting from the main hero with the number seven, we've got Yuki Yamaguchi. The main heroine and number three, Yume Asagiri. Number six and Yuki's younger sister, Sakaya Yamaguchi. Number four and the dude who, you know, can't tell the difference between a guitar and a bass, Hido Kato. Yuki's current boss, by day she's a project manager, but when night comes, <laughs> damn girl. 
Ah, uh, yeah, I know. I had to mention her, and I had, I, I cringe myself doing that. The number two, Sayori Amano Gawa, which I probably got completely wrong, but you know, who cares? And then next up, Yuki's current co-worker, and number five, Suzuka Shimizu. Then finally, number one, Yuki's old friend and currently a bank thief. Aya Saito. Well, it's such a weird ability, this one. Now, with the, all the characters out of the way, once a jackpot is achieved, it grants the user unlimited curse energy. Along with that, it gives them a fully automatic reverse curse technique that lasts for exactly 4 minutes and 11 seconds. The reason for the extremely specific amount of time on this technique is because the theme for, like, pure private love train, admiring you, runs for that exact amount of time. To hit the, uh, mention jackpot, the user needs to engage actively in the game's dynamics, facing a slim 1 out of 239 odds. Obviously, you know, they have to spin to get these odds here or whatever, you know, like to, to win. Once the domain is activated, the rules of the game are instantaneously transferred to the opponent's mind. This is done through, like, taking advantage of the domain's short hit technique. Hikari uses, like, the short hit to transfer the rules and not damage. So as a trade-off for him, the construction and infusion of a curse technique into his domain happens unrealistically fast, completing in less than 0.2 seconds. Man could have probably stopped all those crafty 0.2 domains from happening in Shibuya if he was there, but you know, that's a completely different line of thinking. Plus, along that same line of thinking, and just due to how quickly he can actually throw up his gang signs, it makes this domain extremely proficient in activating first before others. Moving on to like the dynamics of how the game works inside of a domain. Initially, once started, the two opponents will appear on a neutral stage. Before they throw hands, the user has the ability to create three distinct visual effect indicators, shutter doors, reserve balls, and consecutive effects. The door and balls serve as offensive maneuvers, while consecutive effects act as a defensive indicator, rewinding a sequence to undo damage. Doors and reverse balls come in a green, red, or gold rarity to symbolize a higher chance at a jackpot. Rainbow colored indicators or redoing four consecutive effects guarantees a jackpot in itself. The user also has the option to select which visual indicator to generate, but the outcome is left up to chance. Creating one or more visual indicators advances the stage to a Raichi scenario, unveiling two out of the three necessary numbers for a jackpot. When it comes to this new thing that I just brought up before, a Raichi scenario, these are scenarios involving the aforementioned characters from the pure private love train pachinko machine. From what we have seen, there are four different Raichi sequences with different chances of hitting a jackpot. The final train scenario is different though and has over an 80% chance of a jackpot. Each of these sequences will change the layout of the domain, changing it to resemble a different stage, then it will use those characters of the pure private love train in a different way for that stage. I'm not going to go over all of the different scenarios in themselves, otherwise, oh my lord, we are going to be here for a while. This is for the fact that we haven't even been able to discuss what the hell happens if Hikari fails to even hit a jackpot. Pretty much because, like a true gambler, Hikari understands that the house always wins. If someone fails to hit a jackpot, then the scenario will revert the stage back to its original form. The cycle continues until the user either secures a victory or exhausts all chances to do so, with the number of possible attempts diminishing with each unsuccessful jackpot. During the initial activation of consecutive expansions, the likelihood of hitting the jackpot actually exceeds 20%. When a jackpot is achieved, the domain vanishes and admiring you begins its 4 minutes and 11 second counter, playing loudly around the user. Like I mentioned to start with, the user receives a bonus of unlimited curse energy for the entire duration of the song. This unrestricted curse energy comes with no limitations at all, so for those few minutes he's actually considered special grade, and the user can receive additional bonus amounts at random intervals throughout the round. This along with like the automatic use of reverse curse technique prevents the user's body from sustaining damage and renders them effectively invulnerable for 4 minutes and 11 seconds. Once the song comes to an end, the user's curse energy returns to its normal level and their curse technique is fully replenished. This in turn allows them to activate their domain repeatedly, on the condition that they achieve a jackpot each time. With consecutive uses of this domain, the conditions of the previous one will still be active. If the user aligns three odd numbers, their stage begins with advanced probability, rather than the neutral state. In the case of aligning even numbers, the stage commences with faster spins, meaning that he can bring about a jackpot quicker, even with a less of a percentage. Additionally, there's a possibility for the stage to start in hidden probability mode. This is actually taken directly from a pachinko machine and is usually akin to faster spins, but with an elevated probability of hitting the jackpot. 
that's kind of everything we know about good old Hikari's domain expansion there. When I think about it, it's nice having the binding vow of showing one's hand. It means we all get, you know, at some point or another, an explanation of a user's ability. Unless, the, you know, like the sorcerer is far too strong and they don't even need to mention it. But, you know, anyways, anyways. Professional hater Nao Yuzenin came back with like one of the craziest power-ups in the series. His awe-inspiring domain expansion, fittingly named Time Cell Moon Palace, is my favourite name for an ability seen in the series. Unlike the previous few domains that we've been over, casting Nao's domain is pretty stock standard. It creates a black, empty environment, like most other sorcerer's domains, with a few floating organisms seen about it. In the centre is a large main stage that is made up of like a flesh-like substance. This pathway leads down to a large eye that is situated directly behind the caster. The domain's auto-hit feature sends out an injecting tape of animation frames that jabs into the necks of its chosen targets. If anyone makes a single movement inside of the domain, they must adhere by the 24 FPS rule of projection sorcery. If they don't follow those rules, unlike the original technique, they don't get stuck in a frame. Instead, it will result in body-wide injuries on a cellular level. Like most domains, Time Cell Moon Palace enhances the accuracy of the embedded curse technique, honing it in on individual cells. Freezing these individual cells disrupts their normal functioning, resulting in a plethora of tiny cuts across the entire body, rendering the target immobile. After being afflicted by this, any attempt to force movement may actually lead to the severing of an entire limb. This is an extremely lethal domain, however, sadly for Naoya, the dude got hit by a freaking building. Next up, and second to last in all of the known domains, Womb Profusion is a terrifyingly deadly ability in the hands of no one other than Kenjaku himself. As we just saw with Sukuna in the anime, and due to how like the battle was playing out against Yuki, Kenjaku can expand his domain without enclosing it inside of a barrier. I'm assuming that it's also possible for him to enclose it in a barrier, but because of how Tengen was targeting barriers, he purposely decided to not use one on it. To activate this domain, the user places the backside of their fingers together and interlocks them. Enlarging the domain gives rise to a totem-like tower covered in grotesque merged faces resembling cursed spirits. Anyone ensnared within the reach of its unvoidable strike experiences an explosion impact akin to a direct hit from Maximum Uzumaki, although the specific characteristics of this attack remain unknown. In my eyes though, and just because of like the curse spirit styling of this domain, I believe that it's most likely the domain that Suguru could have achieved if he didn't pass on originally. Lastly now, out of the known domains inside of Jujutsu Kaisen, Yorozu's threefold affliction is not actually deadly in itself. Instead, this domain's short hit effect works with the user's constructed items that they may bring into the domain. Opening this domain results in a mainly empty area, interspersed with like oversized organic structures suspended inside of it. Sticking with Yorozu's big bug theme so far, these structures bear a resemblance to the detached brains and spinal nerve cords of insects. As I mentioned above, the main feature of the threefold affliction is bringing a construction thing that Yorozu made into the domain, mainly her perfect sphere creation. If this ability enters the domain, it will result in her win, unless it's Sukuna or Gojo, and that's pretty much it so far that we've seen that would be able to actually stop it. So now, with that, we're at the end of what we've seen domain-wise. Who do you think is going to be the next to like get a domain and everything? If you were to be chucked into the world of Jujutsu Kaisen and had to choose one type of domain, what would it be? No need to like think of curse techniques or anything like that, just domain expansions. I'd love to know down below. Me, uh, I personally, I think I'd want to take Kenjaku's Womb Profusion. The domain just seems insanely deadly and super unexplored, which is something I actually love in itself. I just, I love exploring things and stuff, obviously. That's why I have this channel. That brings me to another point as well, if you guys haven't noticed, how many of those domains feature like random body parts or like nerves and spinal things? It's like domains imagine a section of some imaginary beast and bring it forth, then paste their technique into it in some way, but I don't know like how it would do that exactly. I'm pretty sure it's just what it is and it's some like imagined space that the sorcerer is creating everything, but I, I like the idea of there being some like overriding beast creation or something that you could make. I wonder if the culling game is going to result in a merger of all of those parts to create like the monolithic creature that Kenjaku's wanting to bring to life. You know, that one that we've seen in some panels and stuff, his, his big plan of merging 100 million people. 
So much I want to know, and it's just truly why I love this series. If you have enjoyed this video and found it insightful at all, feel free to leave a like and help push this video to 5k likes as it really helps out with, you know, pushing my content to a bunch of new amazing people. Plus, if you are new around here and want to watch more content just like this, then subscribe. Also, just want to shout out to all my amazing patrons and thank you for all the support over there recently. It's been absolutely amazing. But for now, it's been your professional degenerate, Diavolo, and I will see you all in a bit. Bye.